Welcome everyone. I open this academic ceremony in which Mr. Matteo Bonetti defends his academic thesis, Alternative Factors Driving Pension Fund Investments. Mr. Bonetti, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, I don't see the slides. We don't see either. Put it on back. No slides yet. Let me see if there's someone in the uh, room upstairs to see whether he or she can help us out. Otherwise, I can also go without it. Eh? I think uh, help is, put them, uh, is, put is them. on its way. Ah, I see. But, but they were there before. So we put them on before. But before we saw them, well, something was flashing. happening. Yes. We saw them also before then. Yeah, it's uh, water. It's okay. So this is an even a bit more challenge to yeah, you nice. to do without. No, but, okay. But we are um, confident that you will be able to do so. We'll make it. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Proactor, uh, dear opponents, dear family, dear friends. Uh, welcome to the defense of my PhD dissertation uh, entitled Alternative Factors Driving Pension Fund Investments. So before getting into the details, so what, what a pension fund in the first place is, so well, it is a vehicle to uh, invest the savings of a group of individuals and then smooth their consumption over time by providing them with the, some sort of retirement income. Um, so pension funds are generally part of a pension system, which are normally structured in, a, in, a three, in three different pillars. So in a picture that I had in my, in my slides originally, you would see three separate um, columns in which each one of them will represent a pillar of a pension fund. The first pillar is normally a state pension, which is a uh, a basic income that is provided to retirees upon reaching a retirement age. It's financed by uh, social insurance contributions and taxations. Um, then we have a second pillar, which is uh, an occupational pension. It's linked to the employment contract, and it's generally managed by pension funds or insurance companies. The third pillar is a, a voluntary savings. So individuals during their lifetime saving for retirement. 
Mm, this mm, three pillars historically have been mixed by different social policies in different countries and have led to different developments across the world of this system. So we have countries like Italy or France in which the first pillar mainly contributes to pay pensions. Whereas we have countries like the Netherlands or Denmark in which both pillars equally contribute to pay pensions. Um, in my dissertation, I focus on occupational pension funds in the Netherlands. Um, so there are two different ways of designing an occupational pension fund. So we have on one hand, a defined benefit pension fund, which is essentially um, a plan that has benefits that are defined, predetermined. So an individual will know uh, before going to the retirement, more or less how much uh, he or she is gonna get. Uh, the contributions that are paid by the individuals th sorry, throughout their lifetimes are then adjusted in such a way to um, keep the balance of the pension fund. Um, at the opposite side of the spectrum, we have defined contributions, which these are type of pension funds in which the contributions are defined ex ante and then invested. And the investment return on the invested contributions will determine the actual uh, pension. So the objective in a defined benefit pension fund uh, is to essentially keep the fund in balance, to have enough resources to then make sure to pay back uh, the, the, the benefits. Uh, so if you would picture in your mind in a balance sheet, so you picture on the left side, the assets, these are the total invested contributions. On the right side, you would see the promise benefit. Essentially the asset side has to be big enough to cover this future uh, benefits, which are the liabilities, okay? If these um, assets are enough to cover future liabilities, it means that there's some sort of surplus in the fund, which can help the fund managers in the event in which liability increase in values. Think about in the current state of the world in which we have aging society. Um, retirees know their benefits, but they will receive these benefits for a longer period. So the value of these benefits is it's greater. A surplus can help the pension fund to guarantee uh, these future payments. Um, later in the presentation, maybe in the talk, you will hear about funding ratio. Well, a funding ratio, it is an indicator of this surplus. So if it is above 100%, if we have such a funding ratio being quite high, then it means that the surplus actually exists. So, uh, the finance theory gives us and us and fund managers the tools to basically design an investment strategy for pension funds um, in order to have a well to be able to match this uh, future promised uh, payments. Um, in this uh, dissertation uh, that I'm going to discuss today, I look uh, at an additional potential uh, factor that uh, can influence investment decisions, and, the, and this is the governance structure of a pension fund. So the governance structure can be quite complex uh, because there are many stakeholders being involved. So we have a sponsor of the pension fund, which is a firm or a industry organization that basically sets up this pension fund for the workers and the retirees. Um, we have a board of trustee that is in charge of daily of the daily management of this pension fund and also it's in charge of investing the fund money in doing this activity it relies on the service of external advisors like asset management firms investment consultants or actuaries these are professionals and professional um, firms which operates with multiple fund and other institutions um so in the end, the objective, or at least the, the main finding of, of this thesis is that this governance structure have an effect on investment decisions. And I document three main effects. So the first being uh, a trustee effect, the second being a, an advisory effect, and the, the third being a peer group effect. So in chapter number two of my thesis, I document that trustee characteristics and in particular age can have an influence on investment decisions. Um, so in particular, I find that board members that are generally old tend to invest less in stocks than what the beneficiaries characteristics will predict. So according to theory, if a young, if there's a young population in the, in, in, in the pension fund, 
um, this young population might have an appetite for higher investment in stocks. With the, in the presence of a generally old board members, um, this does not happen. And therefore, we, this indicates that there might be uh, an investment strategy that is not fully in line with the uh, characteristics of the beneficiaries. Um, in chapter number three, I document a advisory fact. Um, this to say that pension funds that have the same in the same advisor or precisely the same asset management firm or the same actuary tend to invest uh, similarly over time, despite the different characteristics. Uh, characteristics being size, being the characteristics of their participants or their funding ratio. In chapter number four, I document um, a peer group effect. Uh, specifically, I show that pension funds tend to follow each other into and out of the same stock. So they tend to buy and sell the same stocks over time. And this behavior uh, can lead to poor performance. So funds that do so more tend to perform worse than funds that do not do so. Um, this is quite relevant also for beneficiaries because in the end, uh, the performance is a direct, uh, has a direct effect on the funding ratio and ends on the sustainability of um, the pension funds in which they participate. So uh, this brings me to the final implication of my thesis. So on first of all, pension funds have room to improve in terms of age and gender diversity. Um, in this way, they could have a better rep so they could represent better the characteristics of the beneficiaries, and hence potentially make uh, better decision uh, better decisions. Um, second, regulations can be uh, designed in such a way to uh, improve, or at least to uh, foster uh, more more monitoring from the board with respect to external advisors. So to create a countervailing effect between the incentives of external advisors and uh, the interest of, uh, of beneficiaries. Uh, and this also can foster uh, transparency. Finally, from a financial stability perspective, if pension funds develop similar investment strategies, either because of uh, um, a common advisor effect or because of this uh, herding behavior uh, of following each other, uh, they might have a, they might develop a similar uh, portfolio that is exposed to similar uh, risk factors, which uh, may lead them to be all in distress at the same time. And this is also undesirable for beneficiaries because, from a system perspective, you you would have beneficiaries all being exposed to shocks at the same time, mm -hmm. and and there are potential spillovers to other financial institutions. Having said that, uh, so these are the key uh, findings of my thesis, which I hope are useful for occupational pension funds. And I give the floor back to the prorector. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bonetti. It was a clear presentation. You didn't miss the PowerPoint presentation at all. So thank yeah. you for that. Thank you. So now we will start with the opposition. And the opposition will be opened by Professor Schotman. He is the chairman of the assessment committee and he's Professor of Empirical Finance at Maastricht University. Professor Schotman, may I invite you? Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, let me first compliment you with a very rich thesis. And with rich, I mean you are doing many different analyses on very rich data and it's a very much a pleasure to read all this and to think about all the implications uh, that you just summarized. So I think that's a, a good achievement and a very good thesis. Uh, for my question, I already was thinking about getting back to chapter four that we discussed several times. And this morning, your supervisor sent me a screenshot that your thesis uh, was apparently picked up by a Dutch newspaper, Financial Dagblad, and reading what they picked out, I thought that was a very good way to start the discussion on chapter four again. And what they took out of chapter four of your thesis is that pension funds that are followers and have returns that are on average about 1.3% less than the pension funds that we call them leaders. So 
it comes out of your uh, chapter uh, about herding. Uh, that made me think quite a bit because about what the, what are the implications of this if we if this is uh, true that these leader funds are doing better than the follower funds uh, does that mean that active management really pays off so that these uh, funds that are the leaders and that are apparently doing active management that they are able to beat the market uh, is one implication of this finding that these follower funds are not doing that well, is that an implication that they should behave very differently so that they should be even more similar to the other funds, contrary to what you seem to be saying in your introduction? And so it leads to a whole lot of questions. And let me just leave it at these two for the moment, and maybe depending on your answer, we can discuss a little bit further. Yeah. Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your kind words and uh, for the question. Um, let me try to uh, first answer a few points. Um, so first of all, in the thesis, or at least in, in, the, in the paper, I'm not really uh, separating, or I'm, I'm not trying to identify leaders there. So with my measure, I really look at just followers and funds that do, are not followers okay so um those that perform worse are are indeed the followers but perform worse with respect to funds that do not follow others so they are not necessarily so the, those that perform less are those that do not follow others but so it doesn't necessarily mean that they are the actual leaders that are being followed so this is a first uh, um, clarification uh, to to your implication yes so um, what do we learn from from this well it is possible that the funds that are uh, not following other have strategies that are better okay and um, and therefore can get them a better a better investment return um, however uh, and in, in that sense if they're active Yes, then it's basically an indication that these funds have some skills and can indeed uh, beat the, the, the market. For what concerns the followers, uh, it can be two ways. So they can either um, engage in this following behavior in order to try to learn from the actions of others that are supposedly better skilled, um, or that they can just simply uh, not and 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 this they do so. Sorry, no, it's not it's not or they do so because they are not able to develop in house the expertise necessary to develop investment strategies that are uh, giving a higher return with respect to the market. I hope that this partially answers your question. It's definitely partially answered. Yeah. If the chair uh, allows me, let me get back to it. So what kind of active management are these, what you call non-follower funds than doing that makes them better than the followers? So the followers apparently by following perform worse. Somehow that looks like maybe they're doing momentum strategies. And so if the, if the successful funds are doing something momentum, then if you're a follower and do something like that, a few months later, you, that may not be a wise strategy. So is that the kind of active strategy that you're following? Yep. And that was what I initially thought. And then reading some of the literature on that, and so I see at least one of the papers that you cite quite often, the CIOS paper from 2004 in the RFS, and that's uh, where CIOS concludes that uh, although we find evidence of institutional momentum trading, such trading accounts for very little of the herding. And so he says that this momentum is basically not what's happening. In another paper by John Campbell in the Journal of Financial Economics also said that uh, maybe there is some momentum at very high frequencies like hour or intraday in what these active funds or what institutional investors, so it's not pension funds in that case, are doing, but over longer horizons like months or quarters, there is no, no evidence that they are doing, these institutions are doing a lot of momentum trading. So that makes me wonder, where does the difference in performance come from? 
Yes, um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your follow-up questions. Um, concerning momentum, uh, I also in the in the paper I also test whether momentum can explain part of the herding or can, uh, and it doesn't. So it turns out that. Uh, if anything, pension funds tend to be countercyclical, so not to do momentum. So uh, uh, buy stocks that are generally performing worse in the previous uh, in the previous month. So that's the frequency that I use. Um, so I think the the outperformance of the non-followers may actually come from a security selection and maybe from the securities that. Uh, so the day buy, but the, the followers do not buy essentially. So because of what I, the, the performance measure that I use, I'm looking at the performance of the entire portfolio, and in the entire portfolio there are securities that are uh, common to funds, to, di to different funds, and these are the ones that are basically uh, in, in which two funds can follow each other. Uh, so it can be that the skills are actually at the security selection level, and therefore the better performance of the funds that are. Um, and so the, the better performance that the, 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 of the non follower of the non followers funds are actually coming from that set of portfolio can be a geographical uh, or a sector uh, uh, type of strategy that uh, may lead them to perform better than the others and the others cannot follow uh, that portfolio because they don't invest in in that either because well they are not aware of, of those securities or they don't have the the, the structure they don't have of resources uh, to invest in specific markets so i believe that the outperformance of uh, the funds that are not followed it's probably coming from a different set of securities thank you we could discuss much more but there are other questions thank you the opposition now will be continued by professor knuf She's professor of empirical microeconomics at Leiden University and also a member of the assessment committee. Thank you very much. So first, uh, dear candidates, uh, I also want to congratulate you with your uh, very nice thesis. It was very interesting to read and I think the, the results that you find are also very relevant for the society. Um, my question is about uh, chapter two. And uh, first, I want to say that I was really shocked uh, because uh, you uh, mentioned that many funds have no female trustee over the entire period. Now, my, my question is not about this point, but I was really worried when I, I saw this question or I saw this, uh, this result. Uh, but my, my question is about age because you were in, uh, investigating uh, the impact of age uh, of the trustees. And in table 2.2, uh, you uh, investigate like uh, what is the effect of the average age of the trustees. You also look at uh, the median age of the trustees. And my question is, uh, would it also be interesting to investigate the variance of uh, the age of the trustees? And uh, now based on your results, uh, what would you expect with regard to that? Dear highly esteemed opponent thank you for your kind word and thank you for your question um so if i understand correctly you're asking the potential impact of the variation within the board on the um on the um on the investment allocation uh, well i haven't precisely tested that so what i tried to do in the thesis uh, to maybe come closer to what I interpret you have in mind, and then correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so in the thesis, uh, I, I thought about looking at basically how the age of the board is distant. So it's far from the age of the beneficiary. So I captured that with a dummy that will basically tell me is, for example, um, the board on average 10 year older than the, than the average participant. So that, uh, considering the distribution of the age in the board so generally senior uh, men because as a matter of fact they're men and compared to distribution in the of the of the beneficiary so i think in, in the thesis in the uh, it's uh, there's a figure in figure one of, of, of the chapter so i would imagine that indeed the the variance will have a, an effect on the uh, on the investment allocate on, on the investment decisions 
Uh, and in fact, so using that, that approach that I was describing before, we, we do see that board in which the age is very different. And 99% of the cases, this means the board is much older than the average participant. That variable plays a role and it predicts e an even lower allocation. So the actual, so this variable that is capturing the, the difference between the two uh, group age is actually predicting an even higher, uh, or depending on how you look at it, even lower allocation to equity than the simple average or the median age of uh, the trustees in the board. So I hope this uh, yes. answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and indeed, uh, now to uh, complement, uh, uh, you also investigate indeed the, uh, the age representation gap uh, multiplied by uh, the percentage of young uh, trustees. So I think that also tells us a little bit about this variance. Yeah, actually, uh, hi, sorry, highly uh, esteemed opponent. Let me uh, rephrase uh, also. Um, yes, uh, so when I interact, basically the this deviation uh, between the board age and the participant age with the percentage of young participants, then I observe that in those few boards in which there's a large difference between the age of, of the board and the age of beneficiaries, the small percentage of young trustees is sort of pooling the allocation more in line to, let's say, a young sort of uh, person life cycle. So the young in, in the young trustees into an old board would favor for or for a higher allocation. Uh, to stocks. Yeah, yeah. So if you would it would make it concrete, yeah, like uh, let's say that we have on the one hand a board with uh, people uh, of the age of 45, yeah. and on the other hand we have a board with half of them age 30 and half of them age 60. What would you expect uh, with regard to the uh, equity allocation? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, um, are you? So are you asking a, a, a number or a... No, just like which direction. Uh... So can you repeat the percentage just to be sure? So... Yes, of course. So let's say the, the first board, you have all people the age of 45. So um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> and the other board, you have uh, half of them uh, the age of 30 and half of them uh, the age of uh, 60. So yeah. the average age and the median age is the same. Uh, but the variance is different. I see. Yeah. No. Yeah. Then I would definitely. Okay. Now I understand. Uh, I would definitely expect that in the board that is more mixed in terms of age representation, and there will be forces opposing each other. But at least there will be forces that would push for uh, lower allocation, so more in line to all older generation, um, based on on a, on a life cycle. And hence, I would expect a lower allocation in such a board. Thank you very much. Then I have Thank a look you. at the chair. <laughs> Thank you. The opposition now will be continued by Professor Nijman. He's also a member of the assessment committee and professor of econometrics and finance at Tilburg University. And he is with us online. Professor Nijman, the floor is yours. Dear candidates. Dear candidate. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hear me? yeah. Yes. So let me first of all congratulate you also on writing very relevant thesis on timely questions using data, medical techniques. Uh, so the thesis clearly shows your skills as well as your knowledge of the literature. Uh, I already had the opportunity to ask many questions before. So thanks for all the very detailed comments. I reread all the 24 pages yesterday, almost a thesis in itself. Um, but of course, this is research, so there are remaining questions as well. And the question that I would like to ask you is on your recommendation in section 6.3. Uh, the problem seems to be that many pension funds can get in distress at the same time and that put, gives them a strong position to argue for changes in regulation. And the example that you give is the lobby for a lower and minimum required funding ratio of Dutch pension funds, 100% rather than 104. So this argument um, 
strikes me a bit as odd and as one-sided from the supervisory perspective. I would think that there are many good reasons for funds to hold very similar portfolios and therefore get in distress in exactly the same scenarios. Standard theory would tell them to hold roughly the market portfolio of equities. Uh, the equity universe is at least dominated by a single factor. And also, if you look at the other main determinants, uh, the interest rate risk, and then the arguments to hedge the interest rates risk or not, or it's all very similar for different pension funds. Um, so you accuse the funds of hurting, um, but I guess the portfolios are similar for very different, but also very valid reasons. So to, to put it a bit bold, um, the suggestion is that you encourage, encourage funds to hold different portfolios um, because otherwise they hurt, but that seems an encouragement to hold portfolios that are suboptimal for their beneficiaries, at least from the uh, standard theory uh, perspective. So please explain, and I'm looking forward to your reply. Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your kind words and for your question. Um, yes, um, I, I, I really like I really like this this point in the sense that um, yeah, so pension funds. Uh, based on theory, should invest into a uh, so-called market portfolio, okay, because it's the most efficient. Uh, and uh, looking at risk and return, um, it is the better, the better, the better investment choice. So the, the the first question, which might sound a bit simplistic, but it's still, um, what is the actual market portfolio? Uh, so pension. So in in practice, institutions cannot invest in anything. So. It's, uh, a um hello keep a normal distance to the microphone please ah, sorry normal distance yeah okay okay yeah okay sorry so um so what is a a market in the market portfolio so um ideally to invest in the market portfolio institutions should have access to all possible assets in the world, any any sort of assets, not only regular stocks or bonds or uh, private equity. So the question is whether they can identify or what they are actually identifying as a market. So market portfolio is their own, yes, very well diversified market portfolio. What I try to address with that uh, research input uh, or recommendation is from a system perspective, so to try to look, or at least to have a warning that if pension funds develop very similarly diversified portfolios, they then will expose to the same market shock. Um, so this, this is the first uh, um, point that I wanted to make. Second, I also uh, particularly uh, grateful that you raised the, the point of the interest rate edging. Um, because yes, so it's I didn't directly tackled it in my in my dissertation, but that's also uh, a potential. It has very key. I mean, it's very it's very important. Has uh, important implications for for pension funds um, and also for the investment decision. So also there, uh, the expectations. Uh, so how are the expectation about interest rate and how are the uh, decisions of hedging interest rates made? So if there's also uh, hurting or a common advisory effect in these decisions, then uh, these decisions to hedge interest rate in a similar way would then, based on interest rate movement, have funds that would react and have uh, been distressed or not, but at least react in a similar way in case of interest rate uh, movement. So my to, to close it, so I think it's uh, the, what I wanted to make, uh, to, what I wanted to stress with that point is that uh, funds may, yeah, lead to have similar market portfolios, which are not necessarily what in theory you would expect to be the true market portfolio because that's not observable and they might approximate it in a similar way, affected by, again, earning or common advisory effects, so, which might also deviate from the true belief of a pension fund. I hope that this uh, addresses your question, and if not, please uh, 
let me know. Well, it explains that I think you agree that in fact they are all in trouble at the same time, roughly. And that's true, but you seem to argue in your thesis that that is so problematic for the supervisor uh, that we should avoid that setting. And roughly my idea would be, well, that's the role of politicians or the supervisors to stick to the rules. Um, so yes, all the pension funds will be in trouble at the same time, um, but that's not a reason to advise them to hold different portfolios which is perhaps not literally what you do, but you come close to it. Highly esteemed opponent, um, thank you for, for, for your follow-up comment. Um, I agree, I agree, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm not saying that we should... Please keep so, distance. So, I, I'm not saying that uh, there should be uh, uh, pressure to all old uh, different portfolio, but it can act as a warning that has, from a system perspective, having institutions that are similarly diversified uh, will imply that they're all exposed to common factors. Um, so again, if they, if they are not all alike, then you might have in fact winners and losers. And I, I'm not sure whether this is also desirable from a system perspective, then you have a group of pension funds that are performing very well, and then a group of pension funds that perform very poorly. This is ideally also not desirable. But at least has, I think, uh, it should be taken into consideration that if all funds are really, really similar, uh, despite, from, despite the fact that they all, do, all serve the same purpose, but if they all very similar, also from other institutions that cooperate, that interact with these funds, um, may create problems because uh, you will have a big portion of the financial uh, system in distress. And this can also um, feedback into other, uh, other institutions' activities. Okay, clear enough. Thank you very much. For your... Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Slijpen. He's professor of European Economic Policy at Maastricht University and also member of the Assessment Committee. Professor Sleiper. Thank you, uh, Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, uh, gentilissimo signor Bonetti. Um, let me first also congratulate uh, uh, you with your, with, your, with your great thesis. I think it's very well written. It's highly applicable, which uh, actually the fact that you already today are indeed in the newspapers is, uh, I think, a clear proof of, proof of that. So uh, my congratulations. My question is on chapter three. And there uh, you come to the conclusion that the so-called overlapping trustees effect is not significant. Most likely also to your surprise, um, because also I find it intuitively at least difficult to understand. So um, basically I have three questions on this. First of all, what might be possible explanations? I think you have thought about that probably yourself. Then um, you do something in, in your, your analysis and you explain that on page 122, footnote number 20, where you uh, state that you take out independent trustees with investment uh, expertise. And I was wondering, uh, aren't you a little bit too strict there? I know why you're, I see why you're doing it, but maybe you're taking away too much uh, explanatory power. And uh, my last question would be, um, did you also consider the role, uh, because you look at, 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 at the governance here, did you also consider the role of internal supervision like a board of supervisors of pension funds, because uh, something similar might be uh, um, this, the, the overlapping trustees uh, uh, might also be an issue uh, when one looks at the uh, internal supervisors. Thank you. Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your kind words and for your questions. Uh, I start from the sorry, I I start from the last. Uh, I, I didn't look into the super, supervisory board uh, when I was collecting the, the data. I, I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't think about uh, including it. So it's, it's, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a good choice. It's a, it's a good comment. I, I could have done. I could do it. I could still 
uh, go back and uh, and also include it because indeed the um, the supervisory board can ex exhibit the same sort of dynamics and the sort the same um, overlapping uh, of of individuals that uh, are present in the board of trustee. Mm -hmm. um, to your previous two questions, uh, yes. So uh, at first sight, it was uh, a bit surprising to not to observe a trustee effect because as a matter of fact, well, these are the ultimate decision makers. So the same person have, sitting in multiple boards will likely have the same opinion. So we'll probably push for the same type of uh, decisions. Uh, the interpretation that I that I that I give of this is that essentially uh, the number of overlaps is it's high, but it's not as high as, for example, what we observe in um, in, a, in actuaries or in or in asset management firms. Therefore, uh, and it's also generally there are on average seven eight uh, trustee members, so it's always one person out of a seven or eight. So it can be that it's difficult for an individual to uh, alone influence the decision making of the entire board. Uh, although things that are that could still happen, which is not picked up by the um, by the um, by the analysis in the thesis, is that boards, even without overlapping position, talk to each other, they know each other, because of course, I mean, it is a relatively small industry. The country is not huge. I guess they're all based more or less uh, in the same cities. They maybe have studied together. So there is also this opportunities of exchange. So it might be that that actually unobservable um, network effect can play a role and sort of um, capture. So it, it, it capture this uh, and and not sorry and not show up in the trust in the overlapping trustee effect. Um, on the second question, so why did I take out the um, the independent trustees? So that was, um, yeah, I was to, for endogeneity concerns. So because um, independent trustees are hired because of, well, it's an ex it's not representing any stakeholder. It's hired as an external expert and therefore are likely to have more knowledge. And therefore, if a pension fund is interested, for example, in investing entering private equity, then it might look for a trustee that has experience in that. And this will likely be an independent one. And therefore, by removing that, I um, I was, uh, well, I, I, I was hoping to sort of remove partially this concern of having trustees being appointed because of their knowledge and hence the effect is not being driven by the overlapping trustee, but the effect is would be driven by the fact that the fund initially wanted to already invest in a certain asset and hence has uh, hired a specific trustee. I hope that this answers your question. Now I would like to invite uh, Professor Smits to continue the opposition. Professor Smits is Professor in Philanthropy and Sustainable Finance at Maastricht University. Your candidate, dear Matteo, congratulations with your thesis. It was last month that uh, Armin Falk published a paper that economists, uh, as a whole, hundreds of academic economists think we should do more policy relevant research. Your thesis is a very nice example of that. And uh, my question, therefore, is also about the policy relevance, namely, mm -hmm. what are the welfare implications? of the findings of your different chapters for the pension fund participant. And let me tell a bit more. So Professor Scotland's question already hinted towards the last chapter, namely that the hurling can reduce the uh, performance on the security selection. And I'm very curious about the other two chapters. So about the age of the board members and the fact that an older board creates more risk averse choices. So is that hurting the welfare of participants? I would say that depends on what the risk preferences are of these participants. Uh, and, and for the, the other chapter about the, the common financial advisors, there I think it depends what these common financial advisors advise. So your supervisor, Professor Bauer, is a common advisor to different funds, all tells them to uh, invest in low cost funds, which would be welfare improving. So it really depends what these common advisors do. 
So I'm very curious how uh, you think about them. Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your kind word and for your for your question. Um, yes, so let me let me begin by uh, by distance. But let me begin with the uh, welfare implication for for chapter number three, and that was precisely um, the point of that, that, that you already were hinting into. To, um, yeah, so what if a, a common advisor gives a uh, advice that can be indeed welfare improving, but what if not? So what if uh, Common, because of a common advisor effect, pension funds develop a, an investment strategy that is tilted to asset classes for which they have no resources, for which they don't have set up the right check and balance uh, in the in, in the board of trustees. So I'm, I'm thinking to give an example to small funds entering in sophisticated alternative asset classes, um, for which certainly certain asset management firm or certain advisors that also provide um, uh, this type of funds have an incentive to uh, uh, to propose, um, but this does not necessarily uh, lead to, uh, I mean, this leads to uh, complication at the fund level, yeah. so, increasing so costs. So if I can follow up on that, but is that a problem of yeah. coordinated advice, Wait, or is that a problem of a, a general conflict of interest, which w would also be there if they all had a different advisor, right? Who, who still recommends them something that is good for them as an advisor, but it's not necessarily because it's a common advisor. I understand. Yeah. Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thanks for, for this follow-up question. Yes. Um, to begin with, I would say it is a general problem that exists also in any type of advisor. The fact that the common, so the, the let's say the additional level of, uh, of, uh, of of complexity that's brought by the common advisor is that this sort of creates this peer pressure with with an advisor advising certain assets that are also advised to other type of so to, to other pension funds that it creates um, this sort of mimicking. Uh, behavior. So an advisor proposes certain asset classes, certain investments, which can can show to a other uh, funds have done the same and have led to good performance. But then this depends on the, on the specific structure of that other institutions. So that type of coordinated advice, uh, on top of the usual in conflict of interest between an advisor and, 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 and the institution, can lead uh, to potential increased costs, which are not uh, good for the long-term welfare of, uh, uh, well, long-term sustainability of the fund and also long-term uh, welfare of the of the beneficiaries. Um, on the first, uh, on the on chapter number two, the uh, the fact that characteristics of uh, of beneficiaries are not fully reflected in the asset allocation, this can also lead to uh, can I have welfare implication? So, well, preferences are not observable, right? But, well, uh, either we could survey right, uh, them or uh, we could uh, at least proxy them with the characteristics. So if we have a population of beneficiaries, which is relatively young, so theory would say this population would um, have an investment that is more tilted to equity. So if this doesn't happen, a lower allocation on a yearly basis to equity with respect to their life cycle may lead to a lower welfare at, at their retirement age. So that would be the uh, welfare implication or so to have essentially a asset allocations that is not fully in line with the average uh, beneficiary. Thank you. Thank you. Now the opposition will be continued by Professor Bruggen. She's Professor of Financial Services um, at Maastricht University. The floor is yours. Dear candidate, uh, dear Matteo, I would also like to congratulate you and also both your uh, supervisors to a very interesting and highly relevant uh, dissertation. Um, it's nice to see that it does not only hold scientific value, but especially also these strong policy uh, implications. Um, chapter two caught my attention. As you know, um, in my own research, uh, I focus on pension plan participants and the question of whether their interests are really adequately presented in the boards um, 
is something that I find uh, um, very interesting and, and relevant. And as you also point out, it may not necessarily be the case uh, because um, these beneficiaries cover both the retirees and participants and uh, their interests may not necessarily uh, be aligned. Right. And also the fact that actually these representatives often come from labor unions um, who may also not necessarily be representative of participants, I think also raises uh, some questions there. But my question actually concerns the gender effect uh, that you find, um, also a topic of uh, interest to me. And I quote from your dissertation where you state that females are substantially underrepresented. Uh, Marika also already referred to it. In 2016, on average, boards had less than one female member and 40% of pension funds had no female trustee at all. And you find marginally significant effects for the presence of the females in the board um, and the allocation to equity. And, and you conclude that the existence of this gender effect indicates that female trustees may, might not be a silent minority. And that the findings confirm that research shows that women are more risk averse than men. As a general note, it always strikes me that men are seen as the benchmarks from which women deviate. One could also say men are more risk seeking, uh, but that's a different discussion. Um, what I find interesting is when I studied the details in the appendix, um, the regression coefficients of women always pointed into the direction of the financial experts. Um, so the people with a finance background, which you also looked into but often they were not statistically uh, significant. But I also observed that you, um, for um, some characteristics of the pension funds, have quite high standard deviations. And that made me really think, um, are the funds that have females um, maybe different than other pension funds? Are there certain characteristics of these funds that could also possibly explain the marginally significant results for the females? rather than the fact that they um, that they have females. Um, and related to this, actually, um, since the share of females on the boards is so low and really 40% don't um, have one, could it be that this uh, distribution also affects your results? Hi, esteemed opponent. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, uh, yes, so first of all, uh, point fully taken on the use of benchmark, uh, I agree. So that was my mistake. Um, and concerning the distribution um, of uh, female and whether fem uh, pension funds with a high uh, representation of females in the board uh, are a special type. Um, well, yes. So given that the small size, given that there's such a small size of funds that have a percentage of, of female, it can well be that. Um, so we are in the presence of sort of tokenism. So highly, well, perhaps larger funds, more visible funds, which are, by the way, all signatory of this uh, principle um, of governance, right? So to have more, um, to have more uh, diverse board, uh, that they enter in the sample uh, with a female, for example. Okay, so uh, funds that are more subject to public scrutiny, there they will be perhaps more likely to have uh, uh, females in the board. Uh, so in that sense, uh, as I also mentioned the thesis, the results can, must be taken with a grain of salt because there are few observations in which uh, we actually have funds with females. Um, although it's pretty, uh, it's, it was also surprising to see that in different specification that the results always pops up. And it's the same for, um, for the financial expertise. So not all funds uh, report their financial expertise uh, of their trustees. Um, but yes, yeah, so it can be that there are funds that are, I don't want to call it special, but at least they have some characteristics. And I, the, the usual candidate would be, okay, visibility, which is linked to size, which puts them in the high of the scrutiny of the public scrutiny. Um, which will then uh, make them more likely to have females, not so much because of uh, particular preferences within the board, but also because of uh, uh, external pressure. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Boulars to continue the opposition. He is financial risk manager at ING Bank. Thank you, uh, Paul Rector. Uh, dear candidate, dear Matteo. Um, so actually, before becoming a risk manager at ING, I was also in Matteo's position uh, as a PhD candidate uh, at 
the Nederlandse Bank. And so that's, that's the place where we met. So it's now with great pleasure that I see that you made it to this point, uh, delivering your great uh, thesis today, um, <clears throat> which really evidences your, uh, your skill as a researcher and also has a nicely, uh, I would say, provoking uh, last chapter, which made it to the newspaper today. Um, my, my question for you uh, concerns uh, chapter two, uh, in which you investigate uh, the relationship between uh, the characteristics of the board of trustees and the strategic uh, asset allocation of pension fund. Um, the riskiness of, of the strategic asset allocation of pension funds uh, is, is uh, characterized by, by different variables, I'd say. Uh, uh, we, we typically think of the, uh, the allocation to equities or the exposure uh, to interest rate risk. Um, you decide to use in your uh, regression analysis uh, the allocation to equity as your explained variable. Um, and I noticed that um, at the same time, you use the, a measure of interest rate risk uh, as an explanatory variable. So I would say those are both variables that say something about the riskiness of the, the strategic asset allocation. Um, and since you're trying to explain the strategic asset allocation as a function of, of board characteristics, it, it felt a bit uh, unnatural to have uh, a, a measure of riskiness, both as an explained and an explanatory variable. Um, and so I was wondering if you could explain uh, why uh, you decided to include uh, uh, a measure of risk is also as an explanatory variable and, and, and why you would want to do so and why it's not creating trouble because I could imagine that if a board, the, the characteristics of the board are such that the board likes to say take little risk, mm -hmm. then uh, that uh, would com be completely absorbed by the, by the, the, the measure of riskiness uh, being uh, the interest rate risk measure already in the explanatory variables. So it would actually reduce the strength of your analysis. At least that's what I would be afraid of. So maybe you could, could uh, react to that. Hi, esteemed opponent. Thank you for your kind words and uh, for your question. And yes, also, yeah. <laughs> yeah. thank you also for all the discussion we had uh, in the past over, over my research. Um, yes, so, um, in, in chapter number two, as a starting point, I, uh, I have a baseline model in which I basically um, look at what are the possible variables that generally would affect the investment, but the strategic asset allocation of a pension fund, okay? Um, and there, I also include uh, the interest rate risk, as, as, as you mentioned. Um, what I do next is then add the board on top, okay? So then I keep this baseline model as the key uh, variables, which I then use in later uh, estimation for as a control. Um, because obviously I don't want that uh, the results that are picked up by the board would be influenced by some unobserved characteristics like you know, size, and one of which being the interest rate risk. Please uh, finish your answer. Yeah. So, um the interest the, the 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 measure that i that i use in the in the thesis is the proxy for the interest rate risk which is not observable to me and the reason why i included it is because um the level of hedging um determines how much risk a pension fund can take therefore excluding it from the set of control variables would would not allow i mean would not allow me to control for a sort of uh implicit risk aversion of the fund. And therefore, I, one may argue that the higher or lower allocation to equity that is linked to the board age is actually coming from a higher or lower risk aversion within the fund, which I hope I can partially control for by including the portion of interest rate risk that is included. Different discussion is, well, the interest rate itself could also be driven by the characteristics. Thank you. Mr. Bonetti, the time appointed for a defense of your thesis has passed. The committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. You and your company are requested to await the results in this room.
Ja, doe, doe eens de laptop door. Waar de mask? Bij de laudatie. Uh, ja, volgens mij moet ik dat ding vast houden. Ja, dat is waar. Dikt. Let's put the microphone back. Mr. Bonetti, the committee has reviewed your thesis and discussed the adequacy of its defense. Because of its positive judgment, it has decided to award the doctorate to you. Um, Professor Bodus, um, <laughs> sorry, is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction according to the Dutch university habits. I will give the floor to your supervisor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee, I hereby present, I hereby confer upon you Matteo Bonetti, the degree of doctor, and grant you all the rights attached by custom and by law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the director, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Matteo, um, it's really a great pleasure to address you today in this happy moment. And uh, you, you managed to do it without slides. I, I brought some notes uh, to talk to you. And I will do that also on behalf of, of course, of Rob. Matteo, let, me at, uh, let me start at the beginning. Uh, some five years ago, we had the pleasure of meeting you online for your uh, job interview. Back then, that was already quite custom in academics. Um, these days, it's more common uh, all over the place. And you immediately made a big impression on us because of your luscious haircut. <laughs> later on, it was only later on that I realized and that you told me that you visit the hairdresser once a year or in case of important uh, events, in uh, live events like a wedding of your friends, or today <laughs> for, your, for the defense of your dissertation. But of course, Rob and I were not only impressed by your haircut, but also uh, by you being a smart guy, being super enthusiastic, highly motivated, and ready to face any challenge that you might face. The four competences you need to do a PhD successfully. And of course, doing a PhD is a big challenge. It's hard work. You work in the evenings, in the weekends. You make long hours. And sometimes it's also solitary work. And along the way, you will get feedback. It can be constructive feedback. can be critical feedback. You will have successes, like appearing in the newspaper, as today. But you will also have to learn to deal with disappointments. Your paper is not accepted at the conference or when it's rejected at the journal. 
Furthermore, in your case, writing a thesis on occupational pension funds in the Netherlands is a challenge, not only because of the language barrier. The Dutch pension system is highly complex. We have a complicated pension contract. It's a, in theory, a defined benefit contract. In reality, it's a conditionally indexed average wage pension scheme. It's incredibly complicated. Also, if you look at the investments of pension funds, uh, your thesis, you will find anything from hatching strategies to return seeking strategies. And not in the least, the governance of pension funds. So I know I saw the slide back, and they had a very beautiful slide on the complicated structure of governments, governance in the Netherlands when it comes to pension funds. And it's really intriguing with all the different stakeholders involved and all the different stakeholders appear in your pension, in your dissertation. And exactly this complicated government structure gave you a unique angle to analyze pension funds. In particular, by identifying drivers, alternative factors that drive investment decisions of pension funds. But what do we mean by alternative factors? Well, these are the factors that we don't find in textbooks. And as you could also have shown today, uh, so we learn in our textbooks that the investment decisions are driven by expected returns, the variance and covariance of returns, and the structure of the liabilities. But obviously, in practice, much more factors play a role. And you showed nicely that, for instance, age and gender of board trustees matter in decision making and the influence of external advisors like asset managers and actuaries. And also you uniquely identify the trading behavior of other pension funds, which seem to have an influence on the trading behavior of these followers that we talked about. And so you nicely show that reality is much more complex and that we also need to look further than what we learn in textbooks. Now, what I really admire is you is that you have a strong vision. Yeah, so you have a very clear and strong vision on how to apply, for instance, certain econometric methods. For instance, spatial econometrics, which originally goes back to physical proximity rather than the distance in a network. You also had strong convictions on which data you want to use. Uh, obviously, you had the luck of using supervisory data, but we also, with the help of Rien, were able to use alternative data, for instance, from LinkedIn. And I'm pretty sure that your findings will find their way to good journals. In fact, we already submitted a few papers at very good journals, and the feedback we got so far was actually very promising. Yeah, but obviously, it will remain hard work to, uh, to do that in the end. And obviously, if you do a PhD, you're also part of a department. So you were here uh, in the finance department. And maybe for the outsiders, uh, if you do a PhD, you might not realize that, but you also have to do a lot of other things. Uh, you, in the beginning, you, form, you follow courses and you have to do some teaching. And in your case, you taught no less than four courses, investment analysis and portfolio management, finance, corporate finance, and also institutional investors. Furthermore, you have to do uh, thesis supervision. You did your fair share in that, in that. You attend research meetings and obviously also social events. And you also were uh, quite regularly present at uh, the Central Bank. And he also went to, the, to Toronto, to Rodman School of Management to further develop your skills and your research. And so uh, for, for those of you who think I want to do a PhD and four years seems like eternity, in practice, you have to deduct all the things that I just mentioned. And so now you're at DMB and we work also, uh, we continue to work uh, closely together. For instance, on something like climate stress testing uh, and the work that we do in, in, for the Euro system. But Matteo, let's also talk a little bit more about you because you're a cyclist. 
And in general, there are three types of cyclists. So you have those that perform well uphill, you have those that perform in long distances, and you have those who perform well in a sprint. And I believe, Matteo, that you have features of all three. First of all, writing a paper is a is an long endurance project. It's a race. You compete with other scientists across the world. And you never give up. You're very motivated to finish uh, the race. You're also a climber. Yeah? So uh, you perform well uh, riding up a complex mountain of data, uh, econometrics, writing. Uh, you do that very well. And you're also a sprinter. And I think we saw that today. So let me tell a little bit more on that. You want to move ahead. Uh, you want to move ahead swiftly. I think that's why you were trying to eat the microphone all the time. <laughs> um, and the same goes for, for, for research and all the things that you do, I think, in life. Because you want to move ahead. You want to win. You want to, you want to be the first, which is good. And by the way, doing a sprint is these, these days a buzzword in organizations, including at the union. At the same time, as a sprinter, you don't care about all the details. Yeah, so uh, you cannot pay attention to everything what's happening around you. And in your case, uh, on correct spelling and grammar. And that is how we know you, Matteo. So if you ever receive an email from uh, Matteo and you see some, some errors, just realize that Matteo was in a sprint, he was onto something, and he want to finish it in time. And he could not wait. Matteo, uh, you're an Italian and you're a family man, and I'm pretty sure that your father, Felice, taught you that. And you talk with your hands. We also said it uh, today. You always visit Italy. You go back home to be with your family, to be with your beloved ones, to help out the mama. And she faces her important moments in life. And uh, you also helped her recently when she had to move uh, to, a new, uh, to a new home. And now you're there for Alicia as she faces some, some, some challenges. And it really touches me when you wrote to me that you had to go out for an hour uh, to accompany you to her work. Actually, she's also doing a PhD. And that you uh, had to carry her back upstairs. I think that was uh, really shows that you know how to set the priorities in life the right way. Talking about you as a person and thinking back on all these five years that we know each other, it strikes me that you never complain. You never complain once, although there were many opportunities to do so. Because we push you forward, backward, left and right. And when you thought you were onto something, and you were excited, and we said, maybe not. <laughs> and I actually believe that once or twice you were talking to me and that you were starting to complain, but you swallowed it uh, halfway the sentence. And I really admire this attitude. And it shows the strong character that you have and that it uh, allowed you to be like this. I would like to leave it here. I would like to thank the Dutch Central Bank and Olaf because they made this all possible. And Rob and I are really happy that we are given the chance to be here and to give you the first uh, congratulations to obtaining this well-deserved title and writing your uh, thesis. We obviously wish you the best of luck uh, in your future career, in your future life. Uh, with your family and friends and uh, Alicia. Being a risk manager, being a scientist, or anything else that will likely come along your cycling path. Uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, I would like to say we're proud of you. Sono Fido Dite. Thank you. Dear Dr. Bonetti, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you with the honor we have acquired today.
congratulations. So, ladies and gentlemen, we get to the end of this academic ceremony. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for being with us today, especially the members of the Corona here present, especially Professor Nijman and Knuf, our dear guests from abroad. Thank you for being with us. The Corona uh, measurements ask, uh, ask you to leave this room and also leave this building. You can wait if you want to outside this building for the young professor to congratulate him. Uh, the family members are um, invited to stay. Once you've all uh, left, uh, left this building, we will uh, take some pictures and then also Dr. Bonetti will uh, uh, leave the building. And as I said, there is the opportunity for you outside to congratulate him. Thank you.